preaching time. Amen. Looking forward to preaching the Word of God this morning. Take your Bibles, turn with me please over to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter over near the end of the New Testament. I encourage you to be back tonight. Five o'clock service. Been working on both messages for a couple days and they're both burning on my heart almost equally. And uh, I told somebody, I said, man, I'm, I don't remember we're going to get up to preach on Sunday morning. I want to preach two messages at the same time. But I will pace myself, amen. I will hold off and wait and preach the second one tonight at five. So be here, please. You're going to miss a good service, a good message from the Word of God if you're not here at the five o'clock hour. Stand with me, please. First Peter chapter number two. First Peter chapter number two. Verse number nine, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Our text verse, verse number 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter said in verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. I want to preach this morning on a plea to the pilgrims. Amen. A plea to the pilgrims. I almost called it Apostle Peter's passionate plea to the pilgrims, but that sounded too much like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickle peppers. <laughs> Lord, help us this morning, I pray, as we turn our hearts and our minds to the Scripture, the Word of God. I pray that you'd feed our soul. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us, enlighten us, and Lord, if we need it, reprove us and convict us so we may leave here today with a greater testimony uh, for you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Coming into the week of Thanksgiving, I love this time of year. I love Thanksgiving. I enjoy the fall season. I enjoy when it cools off. I love the changing of the leaves. And uh, during this time, I've been thinking about Thanksgiving and thinking about the history of Thanksgiving and the people that made uh, this tradition possible. Doing a little bit of research, refreshing your memory. It was in September of 1620. 1620. Brother Hall, that was back when you was a little boy. And in, in, uh, in just in, uh, in uh, yeah, uh, a little ship named uh, the Mayflower left uh, Plymouth, England, carrying 102 passengers. And uh, they, they, was a, they, were, they were called, if you look at the history books, they called them religious separatists seeking a new home, amen, where they could freely practice their faith. And uh, they came to the new world. And uh, after a treacherous crossing, of the Atlantic took 66 days. They dropped anchor near Cape Cod, a little bit further north, and they were they were looking for the Hudson River. And uh, if you go back and study history, uh, Mayfire crossed the Massachusetts Bay about a month later, where the Pilgrims, as uh, they were known, as we call them now, they began the work of establishing a little settlement in a place called Plymouth. In 1621, the Plymouth colonists and the Pilgrims, they shared a harvest feast with the Native Americans in that area. And that has, was the first Thanksgiving that was celebrated in the colonies. And um, I began thinking about the stories that I heard as a child. I used to read the stories and listen to the lessons about Squanto and, and uh, the Pilgrims and the feast. And uh, Governor William Bradford and Chief Massasoit. How many of y'all remember those names? Amen. A long time ago, studied that. And um, the, for more than two uh, centuries, the day of Thanksgiving has been celebrated here in America. It was only really during the time of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln officially proclaimed a national Thanksgiving day to be held each November. Uh, but our country has celebrated a time where they gave thanks unto God. You can't, you can't celebrate Thanksgiving without recognizing God, amen? It, who are you giving thanks to if there is no God? Uh, some people call it Turkey Day. I don't call it Turkey Day. It's Thanksgiving Day. And one of my favorite holidays. And they try to skip it, unfortunately, in many places. They just try to go, you skip right around it. Uh, but I'm thankful for Thanksgiving. And the Bible tells us in the last days uh, that one of the characteristics of the end times was that there will not be 
uh, thankful. And I don't have time to go back and look at all those verses. Romans chapter number one talks about the, the crowd that's been turned over to a reprobate mind. And one of the things he says about them in uh, Romans chapter number one, I said I didn't have time to turn. And I said, while I was saying that, I was turning. Did you notice that? Uh, verse 21 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, one of the signs of the times in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. So one of the signs of the last days is going to be this uh, sense of entitlement. Uh, but a sign of, of, of spirituality and walking with God is there will be a proper sense of gratitude and thankfulness to God for all that he's done for us. And hadn't God been good? Amen. As we just saying, I'm blessed uh, beyond measure. Uh, but as I was reading these verses, I was reminded that God's people, you and I, we're called pilgrims. We're called pilgrims and strangers in our text here. And in the book of 1 Peter here, Paul, the apostle Peter, he, he had a message for the people of God, but it was a passionate message. It was a passionate plea. He uses the word in verse number 11, I beseech you, I beseech you. That's a word that Paul used often. And it's a, it's a word that, that is, shows imploring. I, I, I'm almost getting that on my knees and I'm begging you, I'm asking you with all of my heart if you would do this. And uh, Peter's doing that here as a passionate plea to the group of people that he called strangers and pilgrims. And I want to just look at these verses this morning as I was thinking about the pilgrims that came over on the Mayflower. I thought about we've got pilgrims here today. Amen. We might not wear the big buckles on our shoes and the big tall hats and we might not shoot with those funny looking guns that looks like a, looks like a uh, trumpet on the end. What's that called? Yes, that one. Um, but we're pilgrims, nevertheless. We're pilgrims. And I'm thankful this morning to be identified with pilgrims. I'm going to jump right into this message, give you three simple points from the verses that we've just read. First of all, I want you to notice uh, the reminder of our identity in the verses that we read this morning. He starts out in verse number nine, and he's having to remind the people of God that there's something different about them. Sometimes we as Christians need to be reminded that we're supposed to be different. There's so much pressure on us to conform. There's so much pressure on us to assimilate into society that we have to be reminded sometimes from the word of God, we have to be reminded by God's man that there's something different about us. We do not identify with the world. And I'm fascinated at the different ways that Peter used to describe their new identity. In verse number, uh, verse number nine, he says, but ye are a chosen generation. Chosen generation, what about that? We live in a wicked generation. He talked about a perverse and, and, uh, generation. He talked about a corrupt, uh, ungodly generation, but we are a chosen generation. I'm thankful this morning uh, that we are a chosen generation generation. God has, a, has, has set aside the people of God to be a different bloodline, amen, than the world. Come on now. We're sons of God. We're children of God. Chosen generation in verse number four. And then we saw uh, verse number nine, rather. And then he went on to say a royal priesthood. Well, I like that. A royal priesthood. And you've got the royalty and you've got the priesthood. And we're royal priests. He's talked about being kings and priests in, in another place. But we see here that God's people are referred to as a royal priesthood. There's no reason why you and I as Christians ought to walk around with an inferiority complex. There's no reason why we ought to allow the world and we should allow the ungodly to, to pressure us, as I said just on last Wednesday night, and walk around with your head hanging down a shame. We ought to be thankful for the fact that through the grace of God and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, uh, that we are now royal priesthood. That's a, wonderful, that's a wonderful identity as a child of God. Man, you could preach a whole message on every single one of these. He went on to say, you're a holy nation, a holy nation. He's talking to the people of God. He's not talking to the Jews. He's not talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to 
God's people. Because when, you when you're in Christ, there's no more Jew or Gentile. Amen. He made a new man, a new people, a new nation. We're the people of God, a, a holy nation. He went on to call us in verse number nine, a peculiar people. I like that word peculiar. It doesn't really mean weird. It just means different. Now, I know we've got some weird Christians. They're weird. Which has earned us the name from some people. They call us funny mentally. Or fundamental, but they call us funny mentally. And I've met some fundamentals that were peculiar people. Amen. I can worship with them, but I keep my eye on them because they get a little weird every now and then. But that's not what he's talking about. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 14, he said, he said, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The world ought to notice there's something different about us. The world ought to recognize that there's, something, that there's something unusual about us. They ought to do a double take when they see us. Come on now. We ought not to just fit right in with them. We're a peculiar people. We should be peculiar in so many different ways. And he went on to say, talking about, we're still talking about he's reminding them of their identity. He says in verse number 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. I like that. We're the people of God. Amen. David said like that, said like this, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. <laughs> we are his people. Amen. He, 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 he bought us and purchased us with his own blood. And before we were not a people, but we're now the people of God. We'll go to Thanksgiving and I know what's going to happen. Some of us are going to be sitting at the table, looking across the table and we're going to say, I cannot believe these are my people. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm related to that woman or to that man right there. I cannot believe that we share the same family tree, the same DNA. How many of you got family members like that, that you just, everybody looks at one another, just roll their eyes and shake their head. You don't have to say a word. You just look at one another and go, yeah, we know. But guess what? We're the people of God. That's something to be excited about this morning. We're the people of God. He went on in verse number 11 and he referred to them, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. That word strangers caught my attention as I was studying this out. I come to understand that you and I are going to be a stranger one way or the other. Watch this now. In Ephesians chapter number two, here's what he said about us before we got saved. Are you ready? In Ephesians chapter number two, in verse number 12, he says that at, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He went on down in verse number 19, says, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So before you got saved, you were a stranger, but to God. Once you got saved, you're not a stranger to God anymore. Now you're a stranger to the world, amen. And so if you've got a problem being a stranger, I can't help you with that. The only thing I can tell you is you have some say in who it is you're strange to. You can either be a stranger to the world or you can be a stranger to God. He called them strangers in verse number 11. And then he called them pilgrims. That's the word that caught my eye. Our children in the Christian schools past week had their Thanksgiving party. They all got to dress up. They all got to dress up for Thanksgiving. Some of them dressed up like pilgrim, and some of them dressed up like, like the Native Americans. And I know it's politically incorrect. It's called cultural misappropriation or reappropriation. And I don't give a flip what you call it. Well, they had a good time, and I'm all about it. Amen. I'm for it. And we recognize their contribution and tradition that they established. But I thought about the fact that we're pilgrims. I looked that word pilgrim up. It literally means one who comes from a foreign country into a city or a land to reside there by the side of the natives, a stranger, a sojourner in a strange place. You know what Peter said to the people of God? I need to remind you, this is not your home. You're, I'm, I'm, I'm beseeching you as strangers and as pilgrims. In other words, don't get too comfortable. Don't drive your tent pegs too deep. This is just a, this is just a temporary place. We've got a better home on the other side. I like that, amen. I'm a pilgrim. And every time I read the news, 
Every time I hear the headlines, I have to remind myself, praise the Lord, I'm just a pilgrim here, amen. This is just a temporary place. This is not my final abode, hallelujah. He had to remind them of who they were in our text here. Not only did he have to remind them of who they were, but he had to remind them of what they were to do. Look at what he says in verse number nine. Your chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, watch this, that ye should show forth the praises of him. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Showing forth the praises of him. I was already working on this message and I'd already jotted some notes down about this part of the verse. Uh, when yesterday morning we had, uh, as I mentioned, we had the memorial service, the funeral service uh, for Sister Barzell. And I'm gonna be honest with you, man, I've never done what we did yesterday morning, but she had filled out uh, a list of all the things that she wanted done at her funeral. By the way, not to be morbid, but we're gonna give all of our senior saints one of those forms at the Christmas party, amen. Because it, well, it, it helps when you know I mean, I don't, I, that's not any indication on the food and who's doing the cooking at the Christmas party. And it's not like a last will and testament, but it was a blessing when for the first time in years, I had a piece of paper that somebody had taken the time and said, these are the songs I want sung. These are the verses I want read. This is who I want to preach my funeral. I was like, praise the Lord, that's a blessing. And yesterday at the funeral service, I had the opportunity at her request, the family's request, she wrote this down 15 years ago and gave it to the office and it was in her file. She wanted the last three chapters of Psalm read at her funeral. Now, I wonder, don't, don't read it while you're driving. Because you'll have a wreck shouting all over the place. If it says it once, it says it 50 times in those three chapters. Praise the Lord, praise Him, praise Him, praise the Lord, praise Him, praise Him, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everything. I'm talking about, I mean, it talked about the mountains and the rocks and the trees and the snow and the frost and the rain. So I'm telling you what, my, my mule like to got away from me yesterday reading the last three chapters of the book of Psalm because she, and I told the church, I said, I'm pretty sure that she didn't want us all mourning and crying at her funeral. She wanted us to praise the Lord. But that's what all of us ought to be doing. He left us here to show forth his praises is what the Bible tells us, verse number nine. Show forth the praises of him. God saved us to do something very specific. I wonder how well we're doing it. Some people like to sit back and watch other people praise the Lord. They get a kick out of it. <laughs> look at that, look at that. Whoa, look at that, he's having himself a time. Whoa, look at that lady over there. Boy, she's worshiping the Lord. Yeah, this is not a spectator sport. He had to remind them of who they were. He had to remind them of what they were to do. Then he had to remind them thirdly of where they were. In verse number uh, nine, he says, who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What about that? Ephesians 5, 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He has to remind us, come on now, Sometimes God has to remind us of where we are, we're in the light. Right. Act like it, walk like it, come on now. First Thessalonians 5, 5, he said, you're all the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night, nor of darkness. He had to remind them of who they were. He had to remind them of what they were to do and he had to remind them of where they were in these verses right here. Sometimes we just need a reminder, a sobering reminder from God of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Every now and then we have to sit our kids down. How many of you have to sit your kids down and have one of them family talks? And you, before you go somewhere, and here's what you say to them. Now I need you to act like you've got some sense. Huh? Uh, how many of you said that? Act like you've got some sense, which means they don't, but you want them to act like they do. Reminder of our identity. Number two, we see he talked to them about a restraint from impurity in verse number 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, I'm pleading with you as strangers and pilgrims. Watch this, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. My goodness. 
Three things I notice about that verse. He talked to them about their temperance. By the way, temperance, it literally means self-control. The virtue of somebody who's mastered their desires and their passions, more specifically, their sensual appetites. That, my friend, by the way, is a sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We live in a self-indulging society. We live in a society today where nobody says no to their flesh and to their desires, but Peter here is begging the pilgrims and strangers. He's reminding them, he's encouraging them, he's admonishing them to abstain. Now that word abstain means to hold one's self off of. We find that word used often, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. That's sexual activity outside of marriage. Abstain from fornication. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Boy, he took it up a notch, didn't he? Abstinence, well, that's a thing of the past. We're giving birth control to 12-year-olds in schools now. Teaching sex education to the five-year-olds. The filth and the muck and the mire of the world. Abstinence is a thing of the past, but God's people, because we're strangers and pilgrims, need to be Abstaining. We need to practice temperance and self-control. He taught them about temperance. He taught them about their temptation in that verse. Notice what he says. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. He called it a war. We're at war. I tell you, how many of you come in here sometimes on a Wednesday night, come in here on Sunday morning, and you feel like you've been warring all week? It's because you have been. You have been. James 4, 1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of the lust which war in your members. Right. Talking about the members of your body. There's a war taking place. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7, verse number 22 and 23 says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, my spiritual man, my new man, the part of me that saved, loves and rejoices and is excited and delights in the law of God. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin which is in my members. There's a war taking place in our members. There's a battle taking place with your eyes. There's a battle taking place with your mouth. There's a battle taking place with your mind, with your heart, and with your feet and your hands. Every part of the old man wants to go forward into sin, wants to be pulled and enticed back into sin, but the spiritual man is trying to draw you to God, and there's a war that takes place. That's what he's talking about here. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Work. Unfortunately, many Christians are not living like they're in a war, which is why they're losing. He talked to them about their temperance. He talked to them about their temptation. He talked to them about their testimony. Look at what he said. Verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That word conversation means manner of life, your conduct, your behavior as a Christian. The world is watching you. Some of you think you're, think you're being an undercover agent for God. Well, if I don't tell anybody I'm saved, they won't know. If you're really saved, if you're really saved, they'll know. I hate to break it to you. And no matter what you do, you will never fit in. Right. 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 What about that prodigal son in that far country? Broke. I mean, you got yourself in a mess. Try to hook up with another man from the country. Nobody, there was nobody wanted to identify with him. Even when you're backslid, the world will know yes, that you're saved and backslid. Right. <laughs> Come on now. Apostle Peter standing there at that fire. Remember that story? He had just said to the Lord, I'll go with you all the way to the death. Everybody else might forsake you, but not me. I'm going to always be with you. Just a few minutes later, they've arrested Jesus, and he's in there having this 
kangaroo court of a trial. And he's standing outside, warming himself by the fire. And they looked at him and they said, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? Me, 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 no. <laughs> you got me, you got me confused with somebody else. No, no, I, I, I think, I think you're his. I think you're one of his. No, no, no. They said your speech doth betray you. So he started cussing to try to throw them off. Can I just throw this out? If you're saved and you're cussing on the job. They don't think you're lost. They just think you're a cussing believer. That's not real serious about God. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Just, I'm just going to try to blend in. You can't. You're peculiar people. You're a holy nation. You're a, you're a royal priesthood. You might forget, but if they know you, they know there's something different about you. Talked about their testimony. Keeping your, he said, Keep your honest your, 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 your testimony honest. Honest before the, uh, verse number 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. You say you're a Christian, be one. You say you're a believer, be one. You say you love God, act like it. Live like it. Let your conversation be honest among the Gentiles. He's talking to them here about their battle and their struggle with impurities in the flesh and the lust. And boy, I tell you, we're surrounded by things today that feed that. You almost have to walk through with blinders on. At the checkout counter, you have to be careful. All those magazines they've got there, you can't stand there and read those. You can't sit there and thumb through those. You better, you better leave it, walk away. Television commercials, everything, all the programs, it's all designed to pull us away from God and to feed the flesh. And I'm telling you that you and I, Peter was begging the pilgrims, pleading with the pilgrims as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lust. Don't feed them. Don't cultivate it. Abstain. Starve them. Thirdly and lastly, he talked to them about the results of our integrity in verse number 12. Look at what he said. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Just go ahead and mark this down. The world will speak evil of you. If you don't like people talking bad about you, I don't know what to tell you. But if you're saved and you're serving God, the world will speak evil of you. Here's what you and I have to be careful of, that if they say something evil about us, that it is false and not true. The world will lie. People will say things about you that's hurtful and it's not true. What's important is that whatever they say against us as an evildoer is false. Look right, you're right there in 1 Peter. Look over at chapter number three. You're right there, just turn over one page. Look at chapter number three. Look at what he said in verse number 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. What about that? He says you need to make sure that your conversation is honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the visitation. The results of you and I having integrity, abstaining from fleshly lust, the difference in us and them walking different and remembering who we are and identifying as the children of God, the people of God, and conducting ourselves like peculiar people and a royal priesthood and a chosen generation and a holy nation, remembering that he called us out of darkness into his light. The results of that is that people will then see our good works and glorify God. And once they see our good works, it'll bring God glory. You know that and I know that. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men, watch this, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And I wonder today how many lost people are glorifying God because of mine and your good works. That's a strong question. That's a wrong, strong statement. How many unbelievers see our good works and recognize there's something different about them and God being glorified as a result of that? We're so worried about the world accepting us. 
What about God? Proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in the sight of God, being accepted of Him and getting His approval. Because I'm going to be honest with you, in the day and age in which we live, you cannot have the approval of man and the approval of God simultaneously. That's not going to happen. You're going to have to choose which one you want. You won't have, you won't have both. I was, I was reading about, I was reading about uh, uh, Abraham over in Hebrews chapter number 11. In Hebrews chapter number 11, in verse number, I wasn't going to turn over there, but it says that in verse number um, 11 through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child but she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised therefore sprang there even as one and him as good as dead so many as the stars of the sky and multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable verse 13 these all died in faith not having received the promise but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They didn't fit in. They didn't fit in with the people around them because their perspective was so far off in the distance that they were holding on to something that they never found on this side, but they knew it was on the other side. And they were content and confessed, I'm strangers and pilgrims. You get over down to the later part of chapter number 11 and it talks about it again. It talks about them again. I wasn't even going to turn over there. It talks about them being being uh, strangers, talks about them not fitting in. It says in verse number 36, they had cr trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goat stents, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves. They were pilgrims and strangers. There was no place for them to settle, no place for them to identify and be accepted. He gives us that whole chapter, and then he goes into chapter number 12, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Why is it that we want to fit in, and we want to try to look, blend in, look like everybody around us, when all the people ahead of us did the exact opposite? Pilgrims. Strangers, we're not from this world. Jesus said to the disciples, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. He went on in 1 John and said this. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, love of the Father is not in him. We have no business trying to fit in, and blend in, and assimilate with the lost and the unbelievers. We need to be reminded of our identity we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're the children and the people of God. We need to live like it. And Peter said, I beg you, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust so that your conversation can be honest among the Gentiles. And when they see your good works, they will glorify God which is in heaven. That's what you and I are supposed to be doing. There's a whole lot more to being a pilgrim than eating turkey once a year. Amen, it's a lifestyle. That word conversation in that verse, verse number 12, literally means a lifestyle. And I'm challenging you as the apostle Peter did. I encourage you, I admonish you. Trying to fit in where the world's counterproductive to why God left us here. They keep changing anyway. I can't keep up with them. They keep redefining what they believe and how they believe. I could give you illustration after illustration after illustration this morning, but you know what I'm talking about. They don't, know, they, don't, they don't even know what they're doing. Trying to win the praise and favor of the world is not our objective. Our job is to show forth the praises of him and to bring honor and glory to God as pilgrims. Peter said, I plead with you. This is what you need to be doing. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder this morning if maybe God spoke to somebody's heart. Maybe there's a area in your life where you've got the war going on in the flesh and your heart and in your mind. Maybe you need to be reminded this morning of your identity as children of God, people of God. Come out from among them, be a separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you.
If you're truly saved this morning, the Apostle Peter is begging the people of God to have a testimony that portrays who they are as the people of God. There may be someone here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. There may be someone here today that cannot remember the time and place where they ever bowed their head, bowed their heart, and by faith acknowledged that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And by putting their faith and trust in the finished work of Calvary, they accepted the free gift of salvation and asked Jesus to be their personal Lord and Savior. Would there be someone here today say, Pastor Shifflin, I don't know for sure that I've ever done that. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. And I would appreciate it if you would pray for me. Would you be honest enough with God this morning to slip your hand up so I could see it, so I could pray for you. Anybody, anywhere, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure if I died right now that I'd go to heaven. I've never put my faith and trust in the finished work of Calvary. Anyone, anywhere, there's a phone number on the screen if you're watching the live stream right now. If you'll text that number and say, I need to talk to somebody, somebody will call you in just a few minutes with the Bible and show you from the Word of God how you can be saved.